Okay, welcome back. In this lecture, we're going to continue our discussion of antigen presentation uh, by uh, switching our attention now to the presentation of exogenous antigens. So recall in the last lecture, I introduced two pathways of, of antigen processing. There was the endogenous pathway, which leads to a presentation on MHC class 1. But there's also the exogenous pathway of extracellular uh, derived antigens, uh, which ends up leading to presentation via MHC class 2. Um, so as you can see here, uh, class 2 starts its life in the endoplasmic reticulum, like all proteins. Um, it needs to be made there. Um, but uh, it ends up being trafficked through the secretory apparatus, and it meets up with vesicles containing exogenous antigens late during its life cycle. And so the loading of exogenous antigens onto MHC class 2 happens within endocytic compartments. Um, and then uh, once they're, you know, once they're together, uh, the, the vesicle fuses with the plasma membrane and the antigen MHC class 2 complex is presented on the surface of the cell. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the, the processes of breaking down exogenous antigen and how it's loaded onto the MHC class 2 molecule. Well, antigen is taken up from extracellular spaces. Um, so again, these are, you know, uh, bacteria, funguses, anything that sort of lives outside the cell um, or, you know, pieces of them. It could be whole antigens or whole, you know, whole parasites or whatever. Um, but the idea is that they're taking up into endocytic compartments. And so this might be endocytosis. It might be phagocytosis, all the different ways that we've talked about cells taking things in. Macropenocytosis, if we're talking about a dendritic cell. All sorts of ways for things to come into the cell. But the idea is that they come in through membrane-bound vesicular structures um, that we can sort of collectively refer to as endosomes. Um, and these endosomes normally um, have a neutral pH because they are just full of extracellular fluid. Um, but through the process of acidification, uh, this activates proteases, which are inside of endocytic vesicles. And these proteases degrade the, the extracellular antigen into smaller peptide fragments. So instead of going through the ubiquitin proteasome system, exogenous antigens are broken down by protease enzymes within the endosomal compartments. And so this breaks them down into smaller peptide fragments. Um, and so once this happens, these vesicles fuse with yet an, another pool of vesicles that contain MHC class II molecules that are coming from the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So uh, once these vesicles fuse, the antigens can then be loaded onto the MHC class II molecule and then trafficked to the cell, surf so cell surface for presentation. Um, however, MHC class II molecules, um, like I said, they're made in the ER. So one of the challenges is how do we make sure that MHC class II um, doesn't bind to all of those antigens that are being uh, shuttled into the ER by TAP? So remember that MHC class I is also in the ER, and the ER is full of antigenic peptides that MHC class I is binding to. So how do we make sure that MHC class II waits until uh, the right time so that it's only binding to exogenous antigens? Well, within the ER, there is a structure called the invariant chain. The invariant chain is made at the same time as the nascent MHC class II molecule. Um, and so the whole time that the MHC class II molecule is in the ER, it's bound, and in particular, its peptide binding groove um, is blocked by this molecule called the invariant chain. So this means that MHC class II is never available to bind any antigen as long as it's in the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, as the MHC class II molecule buds off from the endoplasmic reticulum and it begins to enter the endocytic pathway, um, the invariant chain ends up starting to be degraded and ultimately it leaves behind only a molecule that we call CLIP. And so CLIP is um, a fragment of the invariant chain which, uh, which still prevents uh, the peptide binding groove from being fully open and able to access um, antigens. So um, within the ER, uh, the invariant chain does this. Once we start entering the endosome, only CLIP remains behind, but the function of CLIP and the invariant chain are the same. Uh, they prevent uh, premature binding of antigen to the MHC class II molecule. Um, so if we look at this process in a little bit more detail, we start in the endoplasmic reticulum. We have our MHC class II molecule made here. We see the invariant chain is blocking the, the peptide binding groove of the MHC molecule. Um, this buds off from the endoplasmic reticulum and enters the endosomal pathway. 
Um, here, uh, it's still being uh, blocked, um, but once the endosome starts to acidify, which happens, uh, the invariant chain starts to degrade and it leaves behind only the clip fragment. But again, as long as clip is still here, MHC class 2 still can't bind any antigen. Well, this endosome containing MHC class 2 is going to fuse with other endosomes, which are, have been coming in through, uh, again, endocytosis or phagocytosis, um, and it's going to meet up with uh, antigenic peptides, which have been degraded in those other endosomal compartments. So at this point, MHC class 2 is uh, in contact with its antigen. However, it still can't bind because its peptide binding groove is still blocked by CLIP. So we need one more molecule to facilitate this process, and that molecule is called HLA-DM. Um, the purpose of DM is to uh, basically cause CLIP to dissociate from the MHC class 2 molecule. Um, and so HLA-DM is a positive regulator of antigen loading onto MHC class 2. Once uh, MHC class 2 binds with HLA-DM, this causes CLIP to dissociate, and this allows any of the peptide fragments that are in the endosome to bind to MHC class 2. Um, at this point, it's uh, MHC class 2 is ready to go, and so the endosome is going to traffic to the cell surface and uh, with its antigen in tow. And so now it can present that antigen to any CD4 T cells um, in the environment of the cell. So the important proteins here for regulating this process are the invariant chain, uh, which blocks antigen binding in the endoplasmic reticulum, uh, then the fragment of the invariant chain called CLIP, which, uh, which holds the, the, or which blocks the peptide binding groove um, until MHC class 2 comes into contact with the molecule called HLA-DM, um, which uh, causes the dissociation of CLIP and allows peptide fragments to bind and ultimately be presented. So um, these are the major regulatory steps uh, in the process of antigen loading, um, and we can see them uh, summarized here in, in a different way, uh, um, and these should all be uh, things that you recognize here, but I want to um, highlight an additional regulatory step that goes on here. So again, we start with MHC class 2, we see our alpha and beta chains. Um, if we add the invariant chain, we block the peptide binding groove. Um, ultimately, that becomes digested and leaves behind only clip, which prevents binding to peptides. Um, so um, I mentioned HLA-DM, which was in your textbook figure. Um, HLA-DM is going to prevent or is going to um, promote the release of clip from the peptide binding groove, which is going to allow peptides to bind. However, there's a related molecule called HLA-DO, which does the opposite. So um, HLA-DO actually blocks HLA-DM's ability to um, release CLIP from MHC class 2. So these two molecules form, form sort of a seesaw, a positive and a negative regulator of, of antigen uh, loading onto MHC class 2. So um, if, uh, you know, if HLA-DO is able to block HLA-DM, basically we're not going to get any uh, peptide loading onto MHC class 2, and that's overall going to limit the ability of the cell to present antigen. Um, cytokines like interferon gamma increase the DM to DO ratio. So if you think about this, if interferon gamma increases expression of DM, we have relatively more DM um, and relatively less DO. That means there's going to be more active DM that's not being inhibited by DO. Um, and so the more active DM we have, the more antigen loading we're going to have because more CLIP is going to dissociate. Um, so um, this is an example of ways that, for example, things like helper T cells can actually increase uh, a, the process of antigen presentation because helper T cells express a lot of interferon gamma. If they increase the expression of DM within dendritic cells and other uh, antigen-presenting cells, um, they're going to increase the ability of those cells to present antigen um, uh, via MHC class 2. And so overall, that's going to sort of rev up the immune response. Um, so uh, I point this out as one major regulatory mechanism um, that uh, controls exactly how much antigen presentation is going to happen through the MHC class 2 pathway. Um, another important one is a molecule called March 1. So, for example, in immature dendritic cells, but um, in general, in, in uh, professional antigen presenting cells, kind of writ large, um, March 1 is a negative regulatory enzyme which has ubiquitin ubiquitinating function. Um, and what it does is it actually ubiquitinates MHC class 2. And so, if March 1 ubiquitinates MHC class 2, it's going to be targeted for degradation by the proteasome system. And so, the more March 1 we have, overall the less antigen presentation is going to happen. And so uh, we see lots of March 1 in immature dendritic cells because these cells are not activated uh, and they're not actively presenting antigen for that reason. However, if the cell becomes activated, say for example, whether it recognizes a bacterium or a virus through the TLR pathway, 
Um, these, the p pattern recognition receptor activation and other cytokine signals, um, um, they actually inhibit the transcription of March 1 when they become activated. So as the dendritic cell becomes activated, then it's going to decrease the expression of March 1. If we have less March 1, then we have less ubiquitination of MHC class 2. So more MHC class 2 sticks around then. And so that facilitates uh, the process of more antigen presentation through the MHC class 2 pathway. So as you can see, there are multiple mechanisms that kind of limit the amount of MHC class 2 uh, presentation that happens during homeostasis. Um, we don't have a lot of antigen presentation going on via MHC class 2 um, unless we have some stimulus, unless we have some activating event. Um, so um, infection itself tends to turn up the process of MHC class 2 so that, for one, we're not spending a lot of resources on MHC class 2 um, if there's no infection for it to actually uh, fight against. But this is also a mechanism of limiting uh, of autoimmunity. So, um, you know, if there's no infection present, then MHC class 2, um, if it's activating CD4 T cells, it might be doing it through self-antigens since there aren't any uh, uh, pathogenic antigens around. And so um, MHC class 2 uh, activity tends to be really carefully regulated through these mechanisms as a way to make sure that we only have it on when it's useful and, and, and not when it might be actually causing us to attack our own cells. Okay. Um, one additional thing that I want to talk about through the MHC class 2 pathway is a cool thing that specifically dendritic cells do, um, which is a process of cross-presentation. So um, what happens uh, in cross-presentation is that we take in antigens through the exogenous pathway, through phagocytosis and etc. Um, but instead of presenting those antigens on MHC class 2 like we would normally, Dendritic cells specifically have a specialized adap adaptation of this pathway where they can kind of reroute the antigens from the exogenous pathway um, and actually present them on MHC class 1 instead. So that's why we call this cross-presentation. We start through the exogenous pathway, but we end up on MHC class 1 instead of MHC class 2. Now, there are multiple mechanisms that allow this to happen. Um, sometimes the antigens that are degraded within the endocytic compartments themselves, um, they end up getting... Um, directly loaded onto MHC class 1. Often they, um, the antigens uh, end up getting shuttled through the ER, of course, because they need, they need to be loaded onto MHC class 1 there. Um, you can kind of see this in a little bit more detail in this figure. Um, so basically we have an exogenous antigen coming in, and normally this would go through the process um, that we've seen before, where um, it comes in through the phagosome, it gets degraded inside the phagosome, um, it, gets, it fuses with uh, endosomes that contain MHC class 2, that gets targeted to the cell membrane, and so the MHC class 2 peptide complex can activate CD4 T cells. This is what would normally happen. However, specifically in dendritic cells, um, through, through mechanisms we won't get into, and some of which remain mysterious, frankly, um, these exogenous antigens end up getting either dumped into the cytoplasm um, or you know, routed into the ER, but ultimately they get degraded by the proteasome system the way they would if they were an endogenous antigen. This allows them to be shuttled into the ER via TAP and loaded onto MHC class 1 instead. So here we have exogenous antigens being presented by MHC class 1, which is going to allow us to present exogenous antigens to CD8 T cells. So this is actually a very important part of our overall adaptive immune response because this allows us to um, take advantage of our CD8 T cell compartment even for antigens that are not derived from intracellular pathogens. So um, this allows us to use CD8 T cells to fight large uh, extracellular parasites, extracellular bacteria, and so on. Um, and so um, uh, without this process, um, we would uh, only be able to use CD4 T cells for those types of antigens. So um, this uh, greatly expands our ability to fight a much broader set of infections um, by uh, sort of uh, activating our CD8 T cell compartment through exogenous antigens. And again, this process happens exclusively in dendritic cells, which is why they're such an important uh, professional antigen presenting cell population. Okay, let's summarize exogenous antigen presentation. Um, so exogenous antigens, they enter the cell through um, endocytosis, phagocytosis, all those ways that cells eat things or take them in. Um, and these antigens are broken down not by the ubiquitin proteasome system, but instead through proteases within the endosomes themselves uh, that are activated by the acidification of the endosome.
Um, these endosomes contain, uh, containing antigen then fuse with vesicles containing MHC class 2. Uh, so those two vesicular structures need to come together to bring the peptide fragments into proximity to MHC class 2 so that it can actually be loaded. Um, the loading of peptide onto MHC class 2 requires additional partners, which we saw. Um, the invariant chain blocks the peptide binding groove while MHC class 2 is still in the ER. Um, once it leaves the ER, the invariant chain is broken down, but it leaves behind a piece called clip, uh, which continues to block the peptide binding groove um, within the endosomal compartment. In order to uh, remove clip, uh, MHC class 2 needs to associate with HLA-DM. Uh, DM displaces the clip molecule, which ultimately, al ultimately allows peptide binding to the MHC class 2 molecule. Um, we talked about a couple of regulatory mechanisms that uh, sort of turn down this process during homeostasis. So HLA-DO is a negative regulator of HLA-DM. So a DO inhibits DM, which ultimately is going to prevent CLIP from dissociating from the peptide binding groove. Um, this is going to prevent antigen loading onto MHC class 2, of course. Um, in contrast, March 1 instead ubiquitinates MHC class 2, targeting, targeting it for degradation. So this is also, of course, going to turn down ultimately um, uh, all of the uh, antigen presentation through this pathway. Finally, uh, dendritic cells can cross-present exogenous antigens, meaning that they can take uh, exogenous antigens and redirect them through the proteasome in the ER so that they're ultimately uh, presented on MHC class 1 instead of MHC class 2. And this is very important for presenting extracellular antigens specifically to CD8 T cells. Okay, so that's it for the molecular mechanisms of antigen presentation. Uh, in the next lectures, we're going to talk about uh, the genetics of, of MHC and talk about the, the human leukocyte antigen, or HLA locus within our genomes. Uh, a little bit bigger picture, but um, this is another area where um, the diversity of, of our immune systems and, and the way that our immune system is structured to be able to recognize and fight so many different types of pathogens, the way it arises from actually from our genetics. So uh, I'm excited to talk about it. We'll do that next time.